Good morning. Slightly nostalgic moment on a couple of fronts for me because this was the college I studied at and I've sat in the seats you're sitting in many times. Uh, I don't think I've ever stood in this position in the room though. It's a slightly different moment. Um, who did know this morning that the topic was going to be on evangelism? And you came anyway. <laughs> who, so this is a surprise to some of you and I'm I, we might have to lock the door now just so you don't run out in fear, but I know that evangelism is one of these tough topics. Uh, I, I think I said recently where I was sharing that quizzing various people about it, of the ministry of evangelism, if you gave someone the choice in the church between doing evangelism or scrubbing toilets, they would generally choose the toilets. Um, so thank you for coming this morning. It is my absolute honor to speak to you on this topic. It is something I am incredibly passionate about. Um, and the, the content from this morning is just a very, very brief excerpt from a course that I teach on evangelism. Um, it's, there's, there's so much more. If, if I had several hours, I would love to t go through with you guys. But what I wanted to try and do this morning is give you just a couple of very brief little snippets, something very practical that will hopefully help you to just take those little steps in sharing your faith. There's a lot more we could cover, but I want to hopefully just give you something that you will walk away from this and say, okay, I'm feeling a little bit better about this idea about sharing my faith. Because I'm familiar with the teaching that you receive here at this church, I'm going to make one or two assumptions. I'm going to assume to some degree that you are fairly familiar with what the gospel is. Okay. I'm also going to assume that you all are aware that all Christians are commanded to go out and share their faith. Okay. If that's something that you're, you're not 100% sure on or if you have doubts about that, please come and talk to me afterwards. Talk to one of your elders, uh, the pastoral staff here. Um, I'm sure that's a conversation that can be picked up. I'm also going to make another assumption based on statistics and my experience. I'm going to assume that most people in this room find the idea of evangelism difficult. They find it scary. And I'm also going to assume that most of us do not do it anywhere near as often as we should. I'm not talking about standing on the street and talking to complete strangers. That's... That's something I do a lot of, uh, but that's not normative for most Christians. I'm talking about sharing your faith with the people that you encounter in day-to-day -day life. Now, stats on evangelism, they're very hard to get, but every statistic that I find shows that the vast majority of born-again Christians do not share their faith or they do so incredibly rarely. They feel that they do not know what to say. They're concerned about messing it up. And they don't know how to bring up the message of the gospel without it being supremely awkward. So this morning, I want to briefly address a couple of these challenges. And again, the goal is hopefully that you will feel bolder sharing the message of salvation with those people around you. I'm going to look at three things, three key concepts. The first one is who is responsible for conversion. We're going to look at then the challenge of dealing with language and content in a world that does not understand Christianity. And I want to briefly give you a little bit of a, a, something of a strategy to get into gospel conversations. So who is responsible for conversion, the challenge of language and content, and how can we get into the gospel? Now, the, the, the topic of who is responsible for conversion, that would normally be a sermon on its own. We're going to really breeze over this. If you've got your Bible there, would you turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 2, a passage that I assume is very familiar to a great many of us. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 1 to 5. Let me read it for us. Uh, I'm reading from the ESV. I assume many of you will be on the similar translation. 
Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. What does this passage say was our previous state? Dead. Okay. Can a corpse make itself alive? Does it have any power to step up out of the grave and resurrect itself? No. So it needs something external to make it alive. We are described in our, in our flesh as spiritually dead, which means we are unable to make ourselves alive. According to this passage, who gives spiritual life? God. It says, but God, start of verse 4, and it says, made us alive with Christ. So it's not us that causes ourselves to be made alive, right? It says, but God. Now I'm going to skim over a few more passages quickly. You may not have time to turn there. I'll read them out to you. Romans 8, 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. What is the natural state of the spiritually dead person? Hostile to God. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Can anyone respond to this message of their own free will? Do we really get a choice in the matter? No, the, the Bible says that the father draws us. We don't respond of our own free choice. God causes us to be made alive. John 1 verses 12 and 13. But to all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Those who become children of God are, are born of who? Of God. Turn with me, John chapter 3. A very, very familiar block of text again. I assume very familiar to the, to the vast majority of people in this room. John chapter 3, we're going to be picking it up at verse 3. Verses 3 to 6. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Scripture is clear. We must be reborn spiritually. And I think we're seeing a theme. Who is it that causes us to be born again? Do we cause ourselves? No, it is clearly of God. Now, did anyone see any reference here to a person being born again because of an evangelist? Does the evangelist have some magical ability to cause a person to rise from spiritual death? Did any other person cause, as in actually change a person's natural state, in order to make them saved? No, it's all of God, isn't it? So, I mean, it's, this has multiple implications for us, but do we get to lead someone to Christ and then brag that we somehow caused someone to be converted? No. 
because we didn't do it. Now, God may have used us, and we're going to deal with that in a minute, but we are not ultimately the cause of someone's salvation. Did God cause, call us to preach? Well, yes, he did. I assume most people here are familiar with Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Okay? The command that to go and make disciples of all nations. We're called to preach the gospel. Acts 1, 8. You will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. Scripture is very clear. God uses preaching to be the means of bringing someone to faith. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. One more passage to get you to turn with me over to Romans chapter 10. I hope you're seeing a theme in this, that there is a tension here. That ultimately it is God who causes someone to be born again. And yet he has given us this call to preach. Romans 10 verses 8 to 14. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? There's a tension. God alone causes a person to be saved. A person must respond in faith, which will, they will only do when God causes them to be made spiritually alive. And yet God uses Christians to share the news of Jesus with the spiritually dead. We are God's ordained means to bring a person to the knowledge of the good news. We do not convert a person. We are not responsible for whether they respond to the message, but we are called to preach the message. And what an amazing privilege that is. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes in verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. So Paul was aware that he was compelled. And then down to verse 18, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespass against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We have this immense privilege to serve God as his ambassadors. We get to go to this lost world who currently stand as God's enemies and proclaim to them that they are facing punishment, but that the God of the universe offers them terms of peace. We are not responsible to create the message and we are not responsible for their response. We are responsible to transmit the message clearly and in language that the person understands. Does that still sound like a daunting task to you? Two promises in scripture that I think are so crucial to us. The first Acts 1.8 I already quoted. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. And then in Acts 28.20 at the end of the Great Commission he says, and surely I am with you always 
even, <coughs> excuse me, to the end of the age. We are empowered by the Spirit and God goes with us as we do this. One of the most helpful sayings that I learned with my time working with a group called Campus Crusade for Christ many years ago was this wonderful little saying defining what it meant to be successful in, in evangelism. The statement, and I, I, I've memorized it, it's ingrained on me uh, for many, many years, is that success in witnessing is sharing Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. Success in witnessing is sharing Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. Our job is not to convert the lost sinner. You cannot intellectualize someone into the, go into the kingdom with really brilliant evangelism and fine sounding arguments. The strength of our evangelistic skill will never ever convert someone. We are not successful if they bow the knee and repent. We are successful when we faithfully present the message. <coughs> that should be a comfort to us. Because suddenly the responsibility is not on you to cause someone to be born again. God can use our very imperfect proclamation of the gospel to convert people because the gospel is proclaimed. Now, our second big area, and I mentioned a minute ago, minute ago, the fact that we need to transmit the message clearly in a language that the person understands. And it, if any of you have had any experience with overseas mission, I know that you understand this. I cannot go overseas to a place where they do not speak English, proclaim the message in English, have them not understand me at all, and see someone converted. Right? I can't go over to mainland China, I don't speak Chinese, and just stand in the street corner and, and, and hope that people will be converted. No, I need to transmit the language in the language of the people. However, you may not realize this, but the longer you are a Christian, the more you become bilingual. Did you realize that? You speak English and Christianese. Okay? Now, it's, it's a, Christianese, it's a technical language. Um, it's, it's like English, but we use it to speak of things that are particularly Christian. It's, it has its own vocabulary. Uh, it has its own, uh, its words have particular meanings that may not be readily understood by someone outside the church. Words like saved, repentance, faith, sin, heaven, hell, forgiveness, and many other words may be totally unknown words to the non-Christian that you try to speak to. Now, when we want to speak about Christian things, what is our default language? It's Christianese, right? I can speak to anyone in this room using all of the jargon that we use, and you will understand what I'm talking about. Will the non-church person we speak to understand if, I, if they walk in on this insider conversation? Are they going to understand what we're talking about? Leaves us with a choice. We can translate the conversation into regular English that the non-Christian will understand. That's a good option. Or we can teach them some of the vocabulary as we go so that they understand our Christian terms. This is also a good option. Either way, we cannot leave the gospel in Christianese. How will you know if a person has understood what you're saying to them? Okay, what sort of responses might we see? You can always ask them questions, right? What have you understood? Can you explain that back to me? What about facial expression, body language? You ever try to talk to someone and it's really obvious that they, they have absolutely no clue what you're speaking about? And so they <laughs> smile and nod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks, have a nice day. What was he talking about, right? We do these things, visual cues, we can check their understanding, we can ask questions. Either way, we don't want to use a heap of our technical terms and jargon and leave the person thoroughly com confused about what we mean. And the same can actually be said of the content behind our terminology. It may not be that the term itself is particularly foreign to them, but we may have a very different conception of what we mean by that term. There are concepts that we take for granted 
because we have been Christians for a length of time. And in that time, we have developed a set of theological ideas that we treat as assumed knowledge. And in, so in, in speaking to each other, we skim over these details. And kind of thank goodness that we do, right? I don't want to have to stop mid-conversation at church. I'm chatting maybe with Paul here. And I have to stop and clarify that I mean the Judeo-Christian God, who is one God, eternally existent as three divine persons, who each play a particular role in our salvation history. I don't want to have to outline his omniscience, omnipresence, uh, his immutability, his holiness, his impassibility, his justice, his compassion, and all that. Every time I use the term God at church, our conversations would go nowhere if we have to stop and define everything every time. If I had to do that every, every time here, we'd, we'd, we'd never make any progress at all. Inside the church, we share a common understanding of who God is. We understand lots of details about the life of Jesus. We know what sin is and why it's an issue. We know that Jesus' death paid the penalty for our sin so that God could forgive us. The average non-Christian does not share our theological framework. <coughs> I cannot take for granted all the things that I can skip over when I talk to you. Instead, we need to help them understand what we mean, and in particular, what they must understand in order to be saved. Now, to help us understand how our content may need explaining, I want to think through just one key concept of the gospel. I want to think about our concept of God. I cannot tell you the number of times I have spoken to someone on the street who tells me that they believe in God. But when I ask more questions, I discover that their idea of God is totally different to the biblical idea of God. And if at that point I chose to just walk on with the gospel and, and move our way through, at the end the person is going to be thoroughly confused. Think of the ways in our world that people understand God. Think of the many different versions of gods that can be seen in other religions. The Hindus have a concept that there is an impersonal divine essence above all things, but there are lesser beings or gods who have entered this world at various stages. Is that like our God? No. The Jehovah's Witnesses have a similar concept of divinity to what we have. However, they reject the teaching of the Trinity and say that Jesus was not divine. They say that Jesus was an angel. Is that like our God? The Mormons believe that their God was once a person and that we can one day potentially become like him. They're essentially polytheists, not like our God. The Muslim God sounds a little bit like the Christian God in some aspects, but far less personal. He cannot know the, be known the way that we know our God. And they're also strict monotheists and reject the divinity of Jesus. The average agnostic has a view of God that is defi defined through pop culture. Maybe he's the old guy with a beard in the sky. Maybe they think of God as the one who started the world, but then step, just step back and let it run. Maybe they think the God of the Bible is a tyrant. You heard that view before? How would I know what they believe about God with all these possible views? How are you going to explain God to the non-Christian that you meet? Are you going to give them a three-hour theology lecture? Please shake your heads at this point. <laughs> Please don't give them a three-hour theology lecture, okay? I would suggest that the way we explain God to a non-believer is going to depend a lot on who they think God is. How do we know what a person believes about God? <coughs> you can ask them. Such a simple thing to do, and yet... If you ask them and flesh out what they understand about God, when you then explain God to them, you're going to be able to work in with what they understand. Look for the ways their understanding of God contradicts the biblical idea of who God is. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. Does a person have to be able to articulate the Bible's teaching on the Trinity in order to be saved? Now, I'm going to ask for an honesty moment here. Thinking back to when you were a brand new Christian, if I had put you on the spot, could you articulate the doctrine of the Trinity? Anyone? And yet, we, we, you believe you were born again at that point, right? So someone doesn't necessarily have to ha be able to articulate the fine points of what we believe. 
In all, they don't have to be able to articulate the dual natures of Jesus, fully man, fully God. They may not have a full, complex understanding of who God is. However, I would argue you cannot deny the Trinity openly and be saved. You cannot deny that Jesus was fully God as the Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons do. You cannot de deny the divinity of the Holy Spirit. You cannot deny the full humanity of Jesus. Not common in our world, but it, it has at various uh, times been one of the views about Jesus. You cannot deny that there is one God who exists eternally in three persons, co-equal and co-existence, called modalism. The idea that the Father, Son and the Spirit cannot all turn up in the same place at the same time. You cannot add divinity to any other being, whether that's Mary, the Hindu gods, or so on. You do not have to put a non-believer through a comprehensive theology course to understand who God is, but you might have to gently refute a, few, refute a few errors. Does that make sense? When you understand what they believe about God, you may have to correct some things. <coughs> some people believe that God is only loving and never wrathful. Some people believe that God isn't interested in people at all and just lets the world run in chaos. Some people believe that there is a vast difference in nature between God the Father and, and Jesus, or between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. How will you know if you are on the same page in these things? You can ask questions, right? Lots of clarifying questions, and you can ask them to explain it back to you. You will learn very quickly whether they have understood what you're saying when someone has to explain something back to you. One of the biggest trap words is the word repentance, a word that we hear it and we, it's such a Christian technical term that we assume that we're speaking the same language, the Christianese, as the person we're speaking to. Um, what I've found very regularly on the street is that when I uh, talk about uh, repentance with someone on the street, they go, oh, yeah, 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 repentance, repentance. They, what they believe by that is that when I sin, I lose my salvation, and so I need to come back, confess my sin in order to, to be restored to salvation. That's repentance. Is that our understanding of repentance? Do we lose our salvation when we sin? And yet, in certain churched cultures, that's their understanding of repentance. And particularly, I find I, I minister to a lot of African and Islander background people in one or two of the locations where I minister. That's exactly their understanding of repentance. And that's exactly what they are trusting in to go to heaven, as long as I keep repenting. Is that the gospel? And yet, it's a, this, repentance, that's a jargon word, right? They must understand what I mean. You always have to question. I need you to understand just how big of an issue this is. Because we can so quickly use a term or refer to a concept and move on without realizing. But the net effect is that the non-Christian looks at you with a blank stare or they nod along pretending to understand so that they can be polite. One of the biggest tools I use in explaining these hard con concepts to a non-Christian is analogies. I have an enormous number of analogies that I use in my evangelism and I do not have time to cover them this morning. Um, but there are a handful that I use repeatedly. In fact, if you were to shadow me doing evangelism, you'd find there's three or four that just come back almost every single gospel conversation. What is an analogy? Well, it's a way of explaining a difficult concept so that a person understands what we mean. It's a way of helping a person connect with an idea at a deeper level. I would suggest that finding good analogies to explain things is well worth your time when you want to talk to people about Christ and something we can talk about at another time maybe. We must be careful to make sure we choose our vocabulary carefully. We must be sure, careful to explain concepts clearly considering what the listener understands. Now I, I want to make a slight diversion for a second but I, I feel I need to comment about the use of Christian cliches. There are a heap of expressions and cliches that Christians use in so-called gospel ministry that are largely unhelpful because they do not accurately reflect the biblical understanding of the gospel. You need to ask Jesus into your heart. You have a God-shaped hole in your heart. 
You need to accept Jesus. You can become friends with Jesus and you are separated from God. Now, most of these, there's an element of truth in, what the, in what's been said there. And yet, um, these are not really the way the Bible portrays these things, but they've become such common cliches for us. Now, I do need just for a second, I need a volunteer who knows their Bible really well. If you have, if you have any theological training, could you just raise your hand for a second? Ba bachelor's degree, master's degrees, anything like that? I know there are several in the room. Come on, gentlemen. I'm going to pick on one if you don't volunteer. Andrew, could you, could, could you just turn in your Bible, please, to the verse that tells us to ask Jesus into our heart? It's not there. It's not there. Are you sure? You, know, you say you know your Bible very well. Closest reference is 2 Corinthians 13. Oh, all right, okay. But it's not, these, these things, they're not, they don't accurately reflect what the Bible says. And so what we need to do as well is make sure that our own understanding of the gospel is accurate and clear before we uh, try and get into the gospel with someone uh, that we want to witness to. Now I did, that was, that was our second thing, which was dealing with the issue of content of the vocabulary. I want to give you something really practical to take away from this morning. For many people, the process of getting into a gospel conversation is genuinely terrifying. Does anyone find that? We can be honest here, okay? It's, it can be. It can be genuinely terrifying to try and get into the gospel itself. No one wants to look like a weirdo as they awkwardly try to get into a spiritual conversation about Jesus, right? Now, I want to break it up a little bit. I want to suggest that gospel conversations come from three different types of interactions. The first, conversation type one, is where the other person brings it up. And if we're honest, this is the one we kind of hope for, right? We feel a lot safer if someone comes and asks us about what we believe and why we believe it and how they can be made right with God. Would you raise your hand, please, if someone has initiated a conversation with you about this in the last week? Hey, exception. Month? No, one more. This year? So what, if we're relying on people asking us about this, is this going to be an effective evangelistic strategy? Right, okay. Conversation type two is an organic situation where for some reason or another, you're already talking and interacting with someone, and as one of the participants in the conversation, you swing the conversation towards spiritual matters. It's one of the, you're one of the participants in a conversation. You get to have some interaction and, and steer the conversation a little bit, right? Conversation type three is a completely cold conversation where you initiate an interaction with someone for the expressed purpose of sharing Jesus with them. And that's the sort of thing that we see if you in, decide to engage in street evangelism or something similar. Now, I want to be really clear. I'm not here trying to turn you all into street evangelists. I, I promise I'm not. Um, I don't think street evangelism is the be-all and end-all of outreach. I do lots of it, but it is not necessarily the normative thing and I would argue in fact that if we're going conversation for conversation evangelism in the context of relationship is actually more effective because they see your faith lived out and they get to sort of engage with the Christian as well but that said I want to give you just a couple of quick reasons I think street evangelism is very important reason one you will interact with lots more people okay the fruitfulness that we see in street evangelism, conversation for conversation, we don't see as many people impacted as we do in relational stuff. But the sheer volume of people you speak to, you do it long enough, you will see results. We also tend to hold back, reason two, we tend to hold back with people we know because we realize the relationship is at risk, right? If we push too hard, it might damage the friendship. But sharing with a stranger is actually fairly low risk because you'll most likely never see that person again. Sometimes it means we can be a little bit bolder with a complete stranger than you would be with a family member, a work colleague, a classmate, or a neighbor. Reason three, street evangelism is an amazing learning environment for learning to share your faith. Not only is it low risk, so we feel a bit safer giving it a go, but on the street, you can watch an experienced evangelist and they can mentor and coach you. You will grow faster 
in your ability to communicate the gospel on the street. Let's assume you don't have someone asking you about your faith. Okay, well, take option one off, off the board for a minute. Um, and let's just consider how you might actually start a conversation with someone uh, and swing it into, the, into uh, the gospel. Now, there are a load of ways you can get to the gospel. There are lots and lots of tools and other things that you can use. I use lots and lots of gospel tracts. But one that I want to talk about to, just for the remainder of our little bit of time today, give me another time, is the use of questions. Um, I'm a massive, massive, massive fan of using questions to get into the gospel. And the beautiful thing about it, you don't need to have anything in your pockets. You don't need to have tracts with you. You don't need to have anything else. You just ask lots of questions. And there are three particular transitional questions that I want to bring to you this morning that can help you move from a not particularly religious or spiritual conversation into presenting the gospel itself. They're not the only three questions you use in a conversation, but they are three key transitions. Does that make sense? The first question that I, that I suggest asking with people is, do you have a religious background? Do you have a religious background? And I will often respond with that question to any vaguely religious topic, anywhere where I can find some even tenuous link to the topic of religion. What'd you do on the weekend? Well, actually, I go to church every Sunday. Do you have a religious background? What do you think of the decision to detain the refugees? Well, actually, my views on that are shaped by my Christian faith. Do you have a religious background? How come you don't swear like everyone else around us? Well, actually, it's because I'm a practicing Christian. Do you have a religious background? And so on. And so on. So it's almost, it's, it's the bounce back question for anything that someone might say to me if I get half a chance. Um, you can use the question with a track. Did you get one of these? It's got a Christian message. Do you have a religious background? You don't have to respond to a question either. You'd be amazed how much traction you get from simply saying, hey, look, I'm curious. Do you have a religious background? I'm a Christian. Do you, do you have any religious background? Now, why is this a good question to lead out with? And I'd suggest it's because people have a favorite topic. What is everybody's favorite topic? Themselves. themselves. <laughs> right. Everybody loves to talk about themselves, their own views, their own opinions, what's going on in their life. And so it's a slightly sneaky approach, but you're exploiting that to get to the gospel. Everyone loves to speak about themselves and their opinions. And when they answer you and tell you about whatever sort of religious background they may or may not have, the goal is to then ask lots of clarifying questions and understand their worldview, their beliefs. And at this point, I'm going to say to you, you must resist the temptation to preach at them. In this stage of a conversation, do not start sharing what you believe Ask more questions. Why do you believe that? What does that mean? How does that affect your day-to-day -day life? Why have you remained up now that you're an adult? Why did you decide to leave the such and such faith? Lots of clarifying questions. Understand their worldview. There's two reasons. Why do we want to understand their worldview? Well, one, we want to know what they understand already, right? Because that will help us when we share with them. But I think there's also another really crucial reason. Why do we want to ask lots of questions about them? Why do we want to delve into their world? Because listening to them shows that we love them. And we cannot, when we're not just simply out to smash them over the head with our own worldview. I cannot stress enough how crucial this is especially while we are building a rapport with them. It's an old worn out saying, but it's true, that people don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. People will not listen to you in general. They might be polite and, and tolerate you, but in general, they will not really listen to you until they know that you actually care about them. And that is the same whether you're doing street evangelism or talking to your neighbor over the fence or a colleague at work, any context. 
When you ask them what their religious background is, and then you ask lots and lots of clarifying questions, they will know that we actually care about them and they're not just simply some evangelistic target. You will be amazed how much you learn when you just listen to people and ask good questions. My second big key transitional question. The first one was, do you have a religious background? Second one is, what do you think Christians believe? So now I'm switching from what they believe about their own worldview to what they think about Christianity, what they've come to grasp. And just like the last question, it's designed to draw out their understanding. And I would encourage you, affirm when they get something right. Okay? They say something about Christianity that is accurate. It is worth affirming and say, hey, yeah, that's, you're absolutely right. That is a big teaching of Christianity. And I would suggest that you try to resist the urge to correct small, non-essential things and ask more clarifying questions. Clarify, 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 clarify. Because what did we just finish saying earlier about the issue of jargon and terminology? They might throw out some jargon at you. Oh, they, maybe they do understand Christianity. No, maybe they just know the terms. They may not, they probably don't understand it. Ask clarifying questions. What do you think that means? Why do you think that's the case? Where did you learn that? Some of the questions can be responsive. That's, you know, they say, they say oh, I, I think it's, it's all about having faith. Oh, what do you mean by faith? What do you think that term means? What does it mean to you? Resisting the urge to preach a little bit. So we're going to ask them, do you have a religious background? And then we're going to ask them, what do you think Christians believe? Or what do you think is the main message of Christianity? And the third question is, can I explain it to you? So they've just spoken for a significant block of time about what they believe and what they have picked up and understood about Christianity. And it's a permission question. I think it's a very helpful one. And it's usually paired with a response to their understanding of Christianity. You're right, do unto others is a teaching of Christianity. But I think there's something more important that we need to understand. Can I explain it to you? I'm not sure you've quite grasped the main idea of Christianity. Can I explain it to you? Or you might, if, it might be, oh, it sounds to me you may not have had much opportunity to learn about Christianity. Can I explain it to you? And sometimes you get someone, that, when you ask them about Christianity, they're just genuinely clueless. They know absolutely zip. You can say, well, look, I, I really appreciate your honesty. Um, if you're interested, can I explain it to you? And sometimes I will phrase it as, can I explain it to you? Because then when we finish, you'll actually have a better understanding of what Christians believe and why they believe it. You'll be able to make a more informed decision about whether or not you believe it's true. Now, essentially, I'm, I'm phrasing it in a way that I'm, ser off I'm offering to serve them by explaining something that I know that they don't. In general, by this point in the conversation, I've asked them so many questions about their worldview that they don't find my offer to teach particularly offensive. They know that I love them. They know that I actually care about what they believe in and think. Now, there is a disclaimer. You are allowed to jump in and out of this structure, these three questions. Um, you may spend a lot more time on one step and almost no time on the other one. It will be an organic process because the person you are speaking to is not a robot. Okay? They do not have pre-programmed responses. If someone's answer to the first question is that they are a Christian, you might just rapidly jump to question two. Hey, what do you think Christians believe? What does that mean to you? Can you explain it to me? Now, I cannot say this strongly enough. If someone says to you that they're a Christian, please quiz a Christian on what they believe. According to the Australian census data, the last one that we had, does anyone know what percentage of people in this country use the label Christian? Does anyone know the number? It's 52%. Now that's a significant drop from past generations. Do we truly believe that 52% of this country understands Christianity? My experience, all of, I've, I've been out on the street for a lot of years talking to people, talked well in excess of 10,000 people, I'm certain of it. My best estimate is maybe 2% of our country are born-again believers. 
which means 50% of our country owns the label Christian and has no clue what it means. So when you speak to people, they're not going to know. So please qu question them. D best diagnostic question you can ask someone is, if you died today and stood before God and he said, asked you why he should let you into heaven, what would you say? You're, you're, you're kind of trying to suss out what are they trusting in? Matthew 7 tells us that there are many people who claim the label of Christian and are not truly saved. Our country is packed with people who think that as long as they acknowledge some sort of basic Christianity, then God will take them to heaven because they're pretty good people. Now, with all that said, that's time. I have, in some ways, um, I hope I've given you a little bit of something you can use that's very practical. Hopefully you feel that you've, you've come to realize that conversion is not your responsibility. You're just responsible to have a go at sharing the gospel message and doing it to the best of our ability. And I can't, can't tell you the number of times I've seen God use a lousy gospel proclamation to bring someone to true saving faith. Let me pray for us and then we'll close. Our loving Father, it is truly amazing that you would look at us in all of our wickedness and sin and depravity, and that you would love us and send Christ to die for us. It is truly astonishing to us that you would look at us and choose us and grant us everlasting life. But it is also truly amazing that you would give us this immense privilege of serving you as your ambassadors to this world, that you would give us this immense privilege of serving you as preachers and teachers and evangelists and, and, and being your witness in this world. I pray, Lord Jesus, for these people. I pray that they would be encouraged to evangelize more, that they would look at this and say, I, I can do this because God is with me. And that as a result, they would share their faith more. They would tell more people about you and what you've done and that we might see many, many, many more people come to a saving knowledge of the gospel. Lord, would you encourage them this day as they seek to serve you in the ministry of evangelism? I thank you for everyone in this room. We commit the rest of this, this morning to you, the, the upcoming service. We pray as well for our dear brother, James White, that you would speak boldly through him this morning. And that above all things, your name would be exalted, that you would be lifted up and magnified. And in your name we pray. Amen.